I'll switch to you. Oh, oh, oh I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll switch to yours. <laughs> so I shouldn't shout. But can we I can turn it down. Ma one. Maybe a little bit. I tend to try to. Well, smaller, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> John All right, so I'll jump right in and actually first tell you about uh, focus I'm being defined uh, microstructures. And so this is really the expertise of uh, uh, our collaborators, uh, Philip Moll, who is uh, currently at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, but also moving now to uh, EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and his senior graduate student, Maya Barman. So what they have really perfected is um, you know, um, fabricating devices out of a, um, a bulk single crystal uh, um, uh, using a, 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 focused, a focused ion beam. And so uh, they can uh, make these highly aligned um, uh, microstructures with uh, submicron features, and they can virtually produce any geometry that you could um, uh, um, think up. And, um, this is, of course, very exciting for any material that may not exist yet as a thin film or where thin films um, still have uh, inferior properties compared to the bulk uh, single crystals. How do they do this? Well, they take the uh, bulk single crystal uh, use a and fo use a focused ion beam to carve uh, trenches into this uh, single crystal to carve out a single a kind of sliver or slice uh, of the material that then take um, this little lamella or slice of material out of the crystal and put it down on a, a pre patterned substrate with electrodes onto a, and, and uh, adhesion is assured uh, through a small uh, layer, layer of glue. They then evaporate uh, gold all over. Uh, uh, the structure right here, and then in an additional step with the focus ion beam, they go in, remove uh, the gold from
from some part of the, of the lamella and then cut trenches into the structure to define, um, to uh, actually define the actual device and separate out the different electrodes that go to your device. All right, and so here is, for instance, again, an SEM image of uh, uh, one of the microstructures that we've actually, or that will come up uh, multiple times in the talk, which is a small van der Paul geometry. So you see here, the purple region is really where you have cerium iridium and in five in our case, and you have four contacts to the central square in the corners. Um, and so this really allows you to uh, create um, um, uh, well-defined um, um, uh, structures that let you do very controlled uh, transport in a single crystal material. And um, things that you can study with this is, for instance, uh, look for transport anisotropies in the material. And here's, so for instance, an example of a, a microstructure made from cerium rhodium indium 5, where they saw at high magnetic field that the uh, transport becomes highly anisotropic. So the blue trace is uh, measured uh, resistivity along the 110 direction of the crystal, versus the red trace is the resistivity measured along the 1 minus 110. Uh, direction. The other uh, aspect that you know, is enabled by these microstructures is it lets you uh, measure materials that have a minuscule resistivity, which we couldn't do if you were just measuring um, uh, single crystals. All right, so here we're going to talk about cerium iridium in M5. Cerium iridium in M5 is a layered metal with a tetragonal symmetry. It is a heavy fermium metal, and the heavy fermium character uh, when it comes from the cerium uh, 4F electrons. And I think this superconductor has been around for, should have looked it up to have the number exactly, but I think almost 50 years, so half a decade. Um, but still there's a lingering puzzle, which is uh, that if you measure a bulk cerium uranium in M5, you will see the resistivity uh, drop to zero at a critical temperature of about 1.2 Kelvin, Whereas if you take a thermodynamic probes, uh, such as the AC susceptibility or, the, uh, or heat capacity, you find a superconducting transition temperature of about 0.4 Kelvin. And um, this is uh, called the one Kelvin phase in cerium iridium and M5, and really the microscopic origin of, of that is, is still not uh, well understood. And so that is the motivation for um, actually starting to, to make uh, microstructures are out of this material and try to see if, if in this way you can get um, more information on the nature of this uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, more information on what is going on uh, in this one Kelvin phase in cerium iridium and M5. Okay, so then let's look how uh, transport looks in a cerium iridium and M5 microstructure. So again, here is the uh, Van der Poel, uh, uh, geometry that I uh, showed you before. So this is a central square with four contacts in the corners. And there's essentially two transport configurations you can measure in this device. You can, um, well I should mention, the, this device is aligned with a crystallographic axis, so the long direction of the lamella is aligned with the A-axis of the crystal, um, and um, the um, shorter um, um, direction is aligned with the c-axis of the crystal, where the c-axis would be you know, the out-of-plane direction in, in the tetragonal crystal. All right, so there's two configurations we can measure transport in here. So we can source uh, a current between these two contacts that are aligned along the c-direction and then measure voltage between these two contacts, or we can source current in this device along um, the a-direction. And if you do that and measure as a function of temperature, you see that um, um, if you measure transport along the C direction, uh, you see uh, 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 transition to zero uh, resistance at uh, one temperature, in this case um, uh, about 560 millikelvin. Uh, but if you do transport, measure transport along the A direction, um, you see uh, it spike at the time where uh, the transport along the C direction goes to zero, and then eventually um, you also find zero resistance in this direction, but at a lower temperature. And so that is really puzzling. Like no, um, you know, superconductor is either superconducting or not, and it shouldn't depend on the direction that you measure and whether or not you get uh, zero resistance. Um, 
And this is not only happening in one structure, they have really fabricated many, many uh, different microstructures and they all uh, um, show very similar behavior where in one direction you get uh, uh, a higher critical temperature and in the other crystallographic direction you measure a lower different uh, critical temperature. Um, all right. And so the, the question um, that came up is, uh, uh, can we actually use local imaging to understand where this, yeah? So, now, if I was to correct you before, for bulk crystals, they measure the resistive condition at 1.3 Kelvin, is that correct? That is right, yeah, yeah. This is lower, this is? Yeah, yeah. so the, the temperature, so there's uh, what um, all these kind of measurements have in common is that there's two different critical temperatures, but their exact value actually varies per device. Yeah. The bulk, they don't see the energy. Bulk transfer. Uh, not in terms of the superconducting transition. But yeah, there is the resistivity on it. Right, I think the, the, resistiv the normal state anisotropy is a factor of four roughly, I think. Yeah, in the normal state, yes. Um, I'm hesitating a little bit because I don't know how hard they've tried in really um, like placing a lot of different electrodes in different directions on that, yeah. Um, all right, so the, the question is can we use local imaging to actually understand where this unusual transport behavior is coming from and then maybe uh, uh, the second order question is can we in general actually uh, use local probes to provide uh, useful characterization of uh, these focus ion beam defined uh, microstructures. All right, and so this is where you know my favorite scanning probes co probe comes in uh, already here. And so the uh, specialty of my lab is actually to do uh, scanning squid microscopy. So I'm going to tell you about that uh, next. So squid is a superconducting quantum interference device. So it's a um, you know superconducting loop interrupted by two Jacobson junctions. And its current voltage characteristic is dependent on the flux that um, threads the squid. And by that, we can use it as a sensitive uh, magnetic field sensor. The squids uh, that we use are um, you know, not just a simple loop with two junctions, but they're actually um, really long stretched out. And they even have a twist uh, um, in the middle. And then most of the body of the squid is shielded by a, uh, a layer of niobium. Uh, defining two pickup loops uh, that can be threaded by flux. Uh, and one of these pickup loops uh, will be brought uh, close to the sample that we want to image. There's additional circuitry on chip. Uh, we have what we call the field coil, uh, which is essentially the single turn uh, coil going around uh, both um, uh, the pickup loop and this, uh, this balancing loop back here. If we, uh, we can run a current through the field coil, and what that does is it applies a small local magnetic field to the sample, and if the sample has a magnetic response, this is what the pickup loop will detect. And um, this is also the reason why the, um, or this measurement mode is the reason why the squid is um, designed nice and symmetric. If I actually run a current through the field coil here, because of this balancing uh, loop in the back here, there's almost no net flux coupled into the squid uh, while running a current in the field coil. All right. In addition, there's another set of coils that couple flux into the center of the squid. We call these modulation coils. And what they allow us to do is um, keep uh, the flux in the squid constant at all times. Um, so uh, the, the squid signal actually goes uh, to a set of feedback electronics that then uh, feeds a signal into these modulation coils. And it's really that feedback signal that uh, you will see uh, when I show your images. So what that means is that our uh, um, signals are fully linearized. And that is, for instance, important if you, if you measure uh, samples uh, where you need high dynamic range. All right. Um, this is an optical image of an actual squid. You can see that they're fairly large. They're uh, about a, a millimeter long. And then if you zoom in here, you get a, a view of the sensitive area. And this is actually the exact squid that we used uh, in the ex uh, experiment I'm discussing here. So you have like the little uh, squid pickup loop right here, and then the field coil going around it. Uh, the squid uh, loop, in this case, had an inner diameter of 1.5 micrometer. Whoops. Um, uh, of 1.5 uh, micrometer. And so, uh, 
And so uh, when we simply uh, image magnetic fields, it is uh, the, uh, only the, the, the squid loop that, that we use and the size of the squid loop combined with the distance at which we scan sets our spatial resolution, which in this case would be on the order of 1.2 to uh, 1.5 to 2 micrometers. The other measurement mode is that we actually use the field coil. And so in this case, we run uh, a current uh, through the field coil that uh, generates a magnetic response in the sample, which in turn generates a magnetic field that the pickup loop uh, detects. And this is the main mode that I will actually be you know, discussing or using um, in this talk. Um, so then, we're actually, what we're actually measuring is the local magnetic susceptibility of the device. All right. Uh, we take uh, the squids and actually polish them to a corner. Here, this one is, is, is hand polished. Uh, takes a couple of hours and, and a lot of patience. We also have squids where uh, we actually have a deep edge that you know, uh, defines a very nice corner. Uh, uh, and then the, the polishing is a lot easier. But OK, so we, define, we have a sharply defined corner. And then we take this whole chip at an angle of about 2 degrees um, and bring it very close to the uh, device and then start scanning it. And in this way, we can get a magnetic image. All right, so the different imaging modes, again, that we have is just look at DC magnetic fields. And here, I'm starting to show images, actually, of this uh, cm iridium indium 5 device. Uh, since we had a small background field in the cryostat, what, and we had 150 millikelvin here. What you see is just Meissner screening from the device and two uh, vortices um, uh, in, this, in this location. So these are DC magnetic fields. We can uh, run a current through the device that will generate a magnetic field, and we can map out that magnetic field. And that is an image uh, where I think the current is sourced from these two contacts and flows into these two contacts in the device. And then uh, if you do that carefully, you can actually reconstruct uh, um, uh, a current distribution just from measuring this magnetic field component. And so this is uh, showing an attempt of uh, um, uh, reconstructing the x and uh, uh, y component well, I guess the coordinate system is actually uh, the coordinate system of the device. So it's, it's showing the, the current density. Uh, I'm sorry. No, this shows uh, in color you see the absolute value of the current density. And then, of course, the arrows uh, uh, show you the, uh, uh, the direction of the current uh, in the device. And these are um, measured with two different um, configurations in, in which we flow the current. Uh, the main mode I will be uh, using here is local uh, magnetic susceptibility, where we use the field coil. And so here you see an image uh, uh, of the lamella, and at 150 millikelvin, it's uh, pretty uniformly um, superconducting. All right. Um, so here's this image again. Um, this is uh, local magnetic susceptibility, and what, lets, uh, uh, what we can do with this is we can identify regions of the device that are superconducting and regions uh, uh, that are metallic or insulating. Um, so everything where you see you know, bright colors in this plot, uh, we have uh, local superconductivity, whereas uh, you know, black or uh, dark regions um, identify metallic um, uh, parts of the sample or the insulating substrate. Okay, so now, of course, we're going to image what happens in the device as we cool through the superconducting transition temperature. And so now we are here at 600 millikelvin and we are taking an image of the device. And you see that there's actually already four little bright dots uh, in the corners, uh, in, the, in the four corners of the device. If we um, cool uh, to 500 millikelvin, we see that there is an, um, uh, a bow tie, uh, bow tie shaped uh, structure uh, developing in the square. And then finally, if we go again to much lower temperature, uh, we see um, that more or less the full uh, device is uh, superconducting. I should point out that you know, these darker purple regions, those are the trenches that are cut into, into the device. And so uh, we uh, see that the superconductivity actually emerges in a very non-uniform way in this microstructure. And um, I can, of course, 
we've taken images at many more temperatures and I actually can play a really a movie um, seeing how the superconductivity involves. And what we see is right here when we get a zero resistance um, in this transport configuration, so this is the transport configuration where we uh, source current along the C direction and measure voltage along the C direction. So maybe I'll replay that. Let me replay the whole movie. So this coincides with the little dots in the corners actually evolving into you know, two connected superconducting regions, uh, which then grow and finally connect in the middle of the device at which point then we also see zero resistance um, um, uh, when we measure transport along the A direction in the device. Okay, so that fairly like, tells you what actually causes this uh, uh, unusual transport behavior. Let's see if we can, and these are just uh, pulling frames from that very same movie. Uh, let's see if we can even understand where this peak in the uh, resistance along the A direction actually comes from, and that is um, um, we can do that by uh, modeling the device with a very simple resistor network where, um, no, these are, yeah. Um, and so at uh, 0.63 Kelvin, there's only you know, four superconducting uh, dots kind of in the, in the corners, but at 0 0.56 Kelvin, where this direction goes superconducting, uh, suddenly these resistors essentially go to zero, and uh, what that does when I source a current between these two contacts is that the current will redistribute through the whole device, and suddenly a lot more current will actually arrive in between these two contacts, uh, causing a larger voltage drop um, between these co two contacts, which gives me uh, this, this peak in the, in the resistance. And then finally, when all these, uh, when the middle resistor here also switches to zero, that's when I also get zero resistance uh, in this transport configuration. Okay. Um, um, let's see uh, an image, a second device. So this was a device uh, uh, with a funnel power geometry with the four contacts uh, in the corners. Here I have a device again with a center square, but now the four contacts are contacting the device in the middle of the sides. And um, if I cool this device through the uh, um, superconducting transition, I again observe uh, uh, that superconductivity turns on in a very non-uniform fashion, but it looks completely different than the first device that we imaged. Uh, so here I start with two small superconducting regions, kind of right where you know, these two constrictions are. Uh, they grow and then the outside contacts actually start superconducting and then uh, at some lower temperature, again, the full device is superconducting. And really, there's a striking difference between this device and, uh, and the previous device. And of course, here, also, I'm going to play you a movie again, how things look. Goes a little bit slow in the beginning. It's going to speed up sometime soon. Um, so right now you only see these regions, of course, grow, growing and then something happening in, in the outer context right here. And then eventually... Uh, no, there's these regions starting to grow as a function of temperature and eventually the whole device turns superconducting. All right. That's probably enough. Okay, so then, of course, the, the, uh, the question um, um, uh, is what is the source of uh, the this, this spatial uh, modulation that we see in the images? And uh, we um, think or can quite convincingly show that it's actually strain in the serial meridian minimum 5 uh, microstructures or that it's driven uh, by strain in these microstructures. So first of all, why would there be strain in these microstructures? Uh, well. Um, the substrate is sapphire that thermally contracts by about 0.08% when you cool it down. Uh, serum iridium in M5 is a metal and it uh, contracts or it wants to contract uh, uh, more by 0.3% as you uh, uh, cool it down. And so just that um, 
you know, this differential thermal contraction sets up a strain field in the microstructure. And then um, the other actually one on fact about cerium iridium indium-5 is that it is a strain sensitive uh, superconductor. Uh, so uh, these are uh, uh, uniaxial pressure measurements that show that if you press the crystal along the uh, A axis, uh, the uh, superconducting transition temperature uh, uh, increases, whereas if you press along the C axis of the crystal, the uh, transition temperature actually decreases. And so the combination of the two uh, gives rise to a very um, uh, um, uh, non-uniform way in which the superconductivity uh, turns on. And just as a sanity check, if I take the elastic modul uh, uh, modulus of about 150 gigapascal and uh, take 0.3% uh, strain, this computes or this corresponds to you know, uniaxial pressure of about 4.5 uh, kilobar, which according to this actually can shift uh, the critical temperature indeed by um, you know, several hundred millikelvin, which is in line with what we observe. Okay, so we can <clears throat> take this microstructure <coughs> and actually in COMSOL perform finite element um, uh, uh, method simulations. Um, and we can, uh, uh, through that, really compute uh, what uh, the strain field uh, is in these structures. And so here's a, a picture of one strain component and then also the distortion of the, the whole structure exaggerated by about a factor of 100. Um, and so we can compute the uh, strain field along, like the strain component along the A-axis, uh, the C-axis, and uh, the B-axis of the crystal. And um, using the uniaxial pressure data, we can uh, estimate um, uh, these coefficients um, um, that tell us how much TC actually changes with, with the different strain components. And we can compute a local uh, uh, TC map uh, that describes, well, uh, yeah, at each point in the device, what the local critical temperature of the superconductor would be. And if we compare this to the images we've taken, so now I'm pulling frames from this TC map uh, uh, at fixed temperature, and black um, indicates uh, no superconductivity, and the white regions um, uh, show you where the device, based on the simulation, should be already superconducting. And you see that there's a really quite nice agreement between the simulation uh, and the images here, and <laughs> here you really get this nice uh, bow tie structure, which you also see in the images, and then eventually uh, the whole device should be superconducting. All right, yeah? So, just a reminder, the color scale is the magnitude of the current, is that right? Oh, no, no, uh, the, the color scale in this, no, in the... No, I mean in the, in, the, uh, in the maps here. I see, it would be the um, magnitude of the screening current, if you wish. It's like there's different ways to describe our local uh, susceptibility measurements. So one way uh, I can describe it is uh, we approach with a field coil and we generate a small, or we apply a small magnetic field <coughs> to the superconductor and that generates screening currents, which in turn generate the magnetic field that I measure. The other way to describe this is that um, the pickup loop and the field coil have a mutual inductance. Um, and as I approach a superconductor, um, it uh, screens the magnetic field produced by the field coil and reducing the mutual inductance between the, uh, the field coil and the pickup loop. So that's another uh, way to describe it. And really the, um, let's see if I have, well, I'll say it in words. Uh, I had a few images where I actually have color bars with, with units on it and the units are in phi naught per amp, which is really the unit of a, of a mutual inductance. Yeah. Um, Can you run this simulation? Not the gold. Actually, at some point we we did even put the gold in. I mean, the the, the biggest question is always what are you going to uh, use as boundary conditions? And essentially, at, at any interface, we we uh, 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 have the materials perfectly kind of stick together and, and move together. And um, uh, what we have put in is a thin glue layer. Um, um, and as long as that is not like tens of microns thick, it does transmit uh, 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 the strain actually pretty efficiently. Uh, we have put a thin gold layer on top with the same boundary condition. That didn't seem to do much, but uh, yeah. Um, 
the glue layer seems to be like this. Uh, yeah, the, at the bottom, and then there's also, in these structures, there's even also glue a little bit uh, uh, touching the sample from the side, and, and I think that, that actually has probably a more significant effect. So. Um, okay, so then um, we can uh, also compare uh, simulations for you know, the, the, the Thunderpaw geometry and then the second geometry uh, that we imaged. And these are the strain fields, and indeed they look uh, qualitatively very, very different uh, from these strain fields. And if we do also compute from these strain fields a, 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 a local uh, TC map and compare it to our images, we get um, uh, quite ni a nice agreement as well. So for instance here, I highlight that the simulations predict that these three regions should uh, uh, um, start superconducting first, and indeed in the images uh, we see that. Whereas in these regions here, superconductivity should stay suppressed, or the critical temperature is suppressed um, um, substantially, and that we also observe. Uh, yeah? Do you understand the first slide why the middle was protesting the Vegeta dark structure? Um, uh, sorry, so in yeah. this? So there you have a dark spot in the middle, right? Yeah. In uh, the simulation, you have a bright spot in the middle. And then... Oh, I see. Uh, uh, am I? Oh, sorry, sorry, so, sorry, sorry. In the center of the square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Uh, but above, you have dark, right? Right, so the, the right. superconductivity is suppressed here, but we don't get the center of the device uh, quite right. No, that is, so that, that is a discrepancy so between uh, simulations and, uh, we can get this a little bit better. So this one, you know, on this device, because these banks are uh, um, not that wide, and we actually do include glue that touches uh, 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 from the side. It does modify a little bit what's going on on the inside here, and it gets uh, uh, a little bit better. Uh, but uh, you're right, here in these simulations, the, uh, so on this one, it worked out uh, really nicely. On this one, the general features are correct, but the order in which uh, um, uh, uh, you know, which region turns superconducting first isn't quite captured well. The set of the steps here are, you know, with, you know it's a 50 millikelvin step, so it's, I think it's still pretty, Pretty nice. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so we've also looked then at uh, uh, just an unprocessed lamella. So you know, uh, just that single sliver of material without having seen any additional uh, 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 any additional focus ion beam steps. And even this one shows um, uh, uh, a non-uniform way how uh, superconductivity turns on. So it, it, it kind of merges first at the uh, short edges here, and then grows a long bow tie inside of the structure, and then eventually turns uh, superconducting. And of course, we can also capture this uh, reasonably well in the simulations. All right. Um, all right, so um, uh, the takeaway of this is that uh, um, we can really, or we have some control of uh, the spatial modulation um, uh, through picking um, the geometry of our focus ion beam uh, defined uh, structure. And um, uh, Philip and Maya have done um, uh, also measurements on much smaller structures that are too small for us to, uh, to image. Um, and uh, found uh, uh, strong modulations of the uh, 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 critical temperature as well. That, uh, sorry, they found um, modulations of the critical temperatures that exceed what we could observe uh, in, in these larger microstructures that we have actually imaged. Meaning that uh, by making the structures uh, uh, smaller, uh, we can even enhance the kind of strain fields that you can actually achieve. So here, um, uh, this device has kind of a long uh, bar that snakes around, and so you can measure uh, transport along the bar uh, uh, or the section of the bar that's aligned with the A-axis, and then you have other pieces of the device that are actually aligned with the C-axis. And then they have other types of devices where 
uh, um, uh, uh, that ha uh, have a cross shape, and they even share kind of like the center region, and all show very similar uh, behavior. Uh, one thing to note is that um, they have also performed uh, Shipnikov de Haas, uh, uh, or they could observe Shipnikov de Haas oscillations in the devices, which uh, first of all means that uh, you know the whole um, uh, focus ion beam uh, um, uh, device fabrication doesn't introduce any significant disorder into the device. Um, also, um, uh, what they observe uh, lines up uh, very nicely with quantum oscillations done on the single crystals. That suggests that the Fermi surface isn't changing a whole uh, lot um, due to the strain field in the structure. And um, um, meaning that a, a likely scenario of uh, what actually is changing the critical temperature in the uh, serum iridium in M5 is that the strain more modulates the hybridization of the serum for F electrons. All right. And so then um, all these results together um, uh, let us also speculate that probably the von Kelvin phase in serum iridium in M5 is uh, uh, strain driven. Um, um, and uh, as, um, um, one uh, culprit of uh, where strain actually might be introduced in, in the single crystal samples is uh, prior to uh, transport measurements, they actually wire sawed. Uh, and the wire sawing uh, may very well be actually induce uh, strain on the surfaces uh, of the crystals. All right. Okay, so um, so far what I've shown you is um, you know, a mesoscopic explanation for an unusual uh, resistive transition in serum iridium and in five uh, microstructures. Uh, we could explain uh, uh, our observations by uh, uh, the strain sensitivity of serum iridium and in five combined uh, um, with the focus ion beam um, um, features or well, strain simulations uh, that defend, depend on the focus ion beam defined features. And uh, um, by designing, uh, or you know, through these simulations, we can kind of predict the strain field that we'll get. And so we can uh, use focus ion beam machining really to control the strain field uh, in future structures. OK, and so this is. Um, may be exciting because strain is really emerging uh, as, a, as a, or not only emerging, has been around for a while, but strain is really a clean uh, tuning parameter in uh, uh, correlated phases of matter. And so here I show an example um, um, of work done by uh, Clifford Hicks, who has uh, uh, studied uh, strontium ruthenate um, um, as a function of applied uniaxial uh, 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 strain. And uh, he could observe how the critical temperature uh, shifts with applied uniaxial uh, strain and even tune uh, um, the um, uh, uh, tune the Fermi surface into a von Hoff singularity, which gives rise to this uh, peak in the critical temperature. And these measurements also. Uh, uh, can give insights into um, the superconducting order parameter of the superconductor that you study. And so we hope um, that we can uh, use the strain field set up in um, um, the focus ion beam uh, defined microstructures to do somewhat similar measurements. So, so far we have, um, you know, in this experiment, image superconducting regions, and then we've identified the importance of strain. And of course, now. We want to turn this around and um, go and design a strain field uh, and uh, purposefully induce this in a microstructure and then image the response. And um, this will um, depend on how good we can really get at uh, you know, tuning the strain field um, in these structures. Um, and uh, work is unaware where we actually start imaging more of these microstructures and really uh, try to benchmark that. Um, why is this interesting? Uh, one possible way this could be useful is actually figuring out 
uh, which um, uh, strain components um, do couple to a given superconductor. So for instance, if you have an S wave or um, presumably in serum meridian minimum five, a dx squared minus y squared superconductor, um, due to symmetry arguments, you can actually show that um, uh, only the, symmet like, uh, the symmetric combination of epsilon A and epsilon B and uh, uh, strain along the C direction should uh, be able to couple at least to uh, um, a linear order uh, to the critical temperature. However, if you have a, a multi-component multi superconductor, as for instance strontium ruthenate, uh, but also, also several others, um, you sh uh, other strain components like the uh, um, uh, uh, difference here and also shear strain are allowed to couple to the order parameter and can change TC. And uh, uh, the important part here is that really the, uh, um, uh, this strain component has very different characteristics from uh, this uh, symmetric uh, strain component here. So we hope that we can you know, make these microstructures and take images of uh, 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 the local uh, susceptibility to deduce uh, the local um, TC and then use the simulations to tease out if these strain components actually do or do not couple um, to the superconducting order parameter. All right. Um, okay, I hope I have convinced you that uh, magnetic imaging is good to understand anomalous transport. Uh, I've illustrated the role of uh, strain in microstructures. Uh, 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 we have some control about the, over the strain field by, you know, um, um, designing uh, by using the, the focus ion beam to make different geomet geometries. Um, uh, I told you about that uh, uh, we hope to, to use this to actually identify uh, how strain couples to different order parameters in uh, multi-component superconductors. Um, and uh, we're actually also thinking about applying this to other order, not only superconducting order, but there's also materials that have, for instance, very strain sensitive magnetic order. And then, of course, the, the question is, can we maybe even create interesting devices uh, 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 through spatially modulating uh, uh, correlations? So for one device that we're, for instance, thinking about, can we actually realize a, a, a Josephson junction within a single crystal of for instance, serum iridium in M5. All right, and um, I want to thank everybody who has uh, um, uh, worked on this. Of course, uh, all the work, all transport characterization and, and fabrication of the microstructures were done by Philip Mole and Maya Bachmann and his group. Uh, in my lab, Matt Ferguson has done uh, all of the squid imaging. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want to thank all of these, and then I have few more minutes left uh, to maybe um, give you a bit more of an impression how my lab currently looks at Cornell. So I set up there at this point almost uh, four years ago. This is actually my, my current group um, with uh, four graduate students, Brian, David, Alex, and Matt, and three undergraduate students, very talented undergraduate students. Uh, and actually, uh, Rachel is applying for graduate school uh, this semester, so keep an eye out. Uh, so Rachel Resnick. Uh, uh, Ari Kircher uh, and, um, and Justin O uh, right here. Um, we have uh, at this point two scanning setups. One uh, is a 4 to 4.5 Kelvin system that lives in a Montana workstation. And you see some pictures of it closed right here and open up right here. Uh, and um, in this one we uh, 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 do imaging work between uh, 4 Kelvin and 100 Kelvin, we can actually, you know, uh, independently from the squid, heat up our sample and by that reach uh, elevated uh, sample temperatures. Um, we also have a dilutional filtrator in which the work was done that I presented today. Its base temperature is uh, 7.5 millikelvin. I was very excited about that. It was really David Lowe who uh, uh, designed the microscope uh, um, uh, for the dilutional filtrator, which you get some pictures of here. It does fit into the bore of a, uh, of a vector magnet, so even though we can't do scanning squid imaging in high magnetic fields, um, it, it can still be useful to do 
simultaneous uh, to-do transport on the, uh, on the uh, structures that we actually image, and it can also be useful for uh, magnetizing samples uh, prior to imaging or demagnetizing, however you like it. Um, all right. Um, all of our uh, systems live uh, in cryogen-free cryostats, and so it, it is important to us to actually uh, analyze what the vibrations in these systems are, and so we've um, uh, recently analyzed the uh, squid to sample vibrations uh, in our dilution refrigerator, uh, and see. Uh, the way you can actually do that is you take uh, a, a source of magnetic field, here a pretty strong magnetic dipole, and then uh, uh, you, um, at each pixel of your image, you actually take a noise spectrum. Um, and at the same time, you know what uh, at each point your magnetic field gradient is. So you also have to take a few image at different, uh, at different heights. And so then you can analyze at each pixel uh, what kind of additional uh, you know, noise uh, you actually observe uh, uh, in your spectrum and attribute that to vibrations. So if I have a strong gradient in the x direction and I pick up uh, um, excessive noise, uh, additional excessive noise uh, at a given frequency, I know that probably at this frequency uh, there's a lot of vibrations along the x direction between the probe and my sample. And so you can take 2D images and do the fitting as a function of frequency and uh, kind of pull out what the uh, vibrations are in x, y, and z. And here it's plotted as, well, you can't, like, it's hard to see, but it's uh, in r and theta. So that's the lateral vibrations, and z is the, um, uh, 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 is the height. And uh, we find that our vibrations are on the order of 10 nanometers per square hertz in these really high peaks. And for now, that's good enough for us, but we also have pretty a range of ideas on how to further reduce the vibrations in the system, actually, that we hope to implement uh, in the future. Um, <laughs> We are also working on uh, implementing uh, uh, sensitive scanning hall probes, and uh, we are uh, uh, um, uh, trying to fabricate the, these out of graphene. And by now, Brian Schaefer has actually gotten really good in uh, producing uh, high quality uh, 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 graphene devices that are encapsulated. Uh, 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 by boron nitride and have dual uh, graphite gates. And I should say uh, that uh, this is actually in, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Lei Wang, who is a, a Covey postdoc uh, at Cornell, and he has really helped us in, in getting uh, the fabrication uh, uh, right of these. And we just recently have uh, started uh, characterizing these devices and uh, can get to very low carrier densities on the order of uh, a few times 10 to the 9 per centimeter squared, and that gives us a truly giant Hall coefficient. Uh, since the highest Hall coefficient that has ever been reported for, um, uh, uh, for a Hall probe, it's a little bit cheating because we see a giant Hall coefficient at 10 nano amps uh, uh, bias current, but that's not a practical uh, uh, current to actually use this as a Hall probe sensor. So to use this as a useful Hall probe sensor, we have to apply maybe a microamp, five microamps, at which point the, uh, the Hall coefficient will also start rounding off. But nevertheless, we can achieve, uh, uh, if we uh, you know, analyze how this evolves with bias current, um, and we measure uh, what uh, uh, the noise is in this Hall probe, we do achieve uh, right now uh, 60 nanotesla per square hertz field sensitivity. And we might even be able to boost that still a little bit more um, with, for instance, cryogenic amplification and, and other means. Okay, so I'm, I'm really quite optimistic about these. And what I'm really curious about is actually if uh, uh, this is done at low field, I'm really curious if we actually can use the quantum Hall regime in the Hall probe itself as a sensitive magnetic field detector. But um, that, that, that's work in progress. All right. We're also developing a different type of squid where uh, we use microwave reflectometry to, uh, to read out uh, the squid. Uh, currently, our squid, squids are read out in a direct current scheme, but you can actually capacitively shunt a squid, at which point 
the squid acts as a flux dependent inductor. Um, if you shunt it with a capacitor, you get an LC resonator whose resonance frequency depends on the flux in the squid. And so uh, if you tune the, the resonance frequency can in the few, be in the few gigahertzes, and at that point you can uh, uh, read out the flux in the squid by analyzing the phase and amplitude of microwaves that are reflected back uh, from your squid circuit. And so we recently got this to work just in a four Kelvin dipping probe, and, and hopefully it's going to come in the delusional ref refrigerator soon. The motivation for doing this is that it will improve the sensitivity at least by another factor of 10, and also give us much higher bandwidth, uh, up to a few hundred megahertz. All right, with all this, I'm actually at the end. So now I want to thank really uh, uh, my lab. It's been a, a lot of fun uh, uh, working with this group in the last couple of years. And I'd like to thank all my uh, different collaborators at Cornell, uh, as well as uh, collaborators uh, that we're actually teaming up with to uh, keep the supply of squids going. The squids that I actually uh, uh, used uh, in this experiment and described to you, uh, none of us uh, fabricates these uh, in-house, but uh, they are fabricated in a, in a commercial uh, niobium foundry, in this case at Hypris, uh, which is in the US. All right, with all this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that the strain globally is coming from the mismatch and the thermal contraction mm -hmm. of the subject form. But what is the maximum that you get at, at this point? That's what Ask is about. Is it bigger than like the global 0.3% locally, or are you kind of globally constrained to that? I see. It goes uh, a little bit higher than 0.3%, but the 0.3% definitely does uh, set the, the overall scale. I think in the, in the simulations, maybe it peaks up to like 0.5 or so, but it's not. It's not an order of magnitude okay. beyond that, yeah. Uh, we are thinking to also uh, start looking at other substrates. So sapphire contracts less than cerium meridium indium-5. Maybe you can find uh, uh, other substrates that, uh, that would actually uh, contract uh, more than cerium meridium indium-5. In principle, we can work. You know, it's hard to do transport that way, but we could even work on um, uh, on metallic substrates, for instance. Wouldn't be a problem uh, for us. Buckle. Uh, but it's it is. Oh, I see. It is. There's yeah. glue everywhere below okay, it. Below it too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They they so Philip and Maya can in principle even make suspended devices and play tricks like this. So we're, we're okay. there's a lot of you know playful thinking that we have right now, and we'll have to identify which what is reasonable and 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 whatnot. Another kind of cute idea is to maybe instead of using so right now they're using a type of epoxy, but you can actually also glue down devices just with photoresist. It's sticky enough. So then you could imagine kind of. What if we pattern the photoresist uh, um, and, and, and yeah, play these kind of games? But then there's limits to, to what kind of length scales you can go with that. And so we'll have to see if it would be something useful or not, or just something. Yeah, okay. we'll see. Yeah. Hi. Um, the screen that you applied, so it's, it's a bit weird. Uh, you think of the same field or convention, right? So in your sample, the screen uh, where, you, uh, where you calculate the screen is always uh, Expensive or expensive? No, it goes both ways. Uh, and, and actually, for that, but only because there are the trenches. So if we, oh, oh no, need to take it. And so that's really why, where, uh, uh, well, I guess it doesn't, no, no, it go, does go. Uh, um, both ways, because there's also still uh, the the Poisson ratio. Like if I squish it along one direction, I like somewhere else has to give. And and so but in which, in which way is the extensive strain that you stress that you see? Or because if you have this kind of strain, right? In, in one mm -hmm. way you stress like this, the other way you compress. So in this kind of sample, when you compress, it has to give the green, or or is the opposite? Uh, so, so in serum meridium in five, it will. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, 
that I was like, uh, I think this one is negative and this one is positive. I might be doing it wrong in my head, but one is positive, one is negative. Just because that comes from the uniaxial pressure measurements already. If I, if I press along one direction, TC goes up. If I press along the other direction, TC goes down. Yeah, yeah. And there are um, uh, more superconductors will, I, like it's not, you know, it looks like maybe cerium iridium in M5 is very special, but if you actually start uh, digging, digging up uh, uh, um, uh, pretty old papers at parts, you will find that a lot of superconductors actually have these kind of properties. Yeah. So it could be applied to uh, quite a few other ones as well. <laughs> do thermally cycle these devices? Is the amount of true conductivity pretty reproducible, or does it change? That's a good question. So thermally cycling, we haven't done all the way to room temperature, which would probably be the, the relevant temperature. Uh, so we haven't done that because uh, we felt like everything looks uh, pretty consistent, but it's actually a nice suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, you know, you would. Uh, the glue would kind of thaw yeah. again, or, or and, and yeah. So maybe in the details you would actually find uh, small differences. I could imagine. Yeah. Not sure, but could be. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh yeah. Um, so right now, spatial resolution is limited by the size of the chip. That is correct. Yeah. Can you actually reduce down to smaller? What limit you the spatial resolution? I see. Um, so let's see. So the the it's in, in when we measure magnetic susceptibility, it's a bit of both. Like there's the the point spread function in a way is actually hard to understand because the the local source field also plays a role. But just if, it, if I just think about magnetic imaging, then you're right. It's the pickup loop, and then also uh, combined with how close can I actually scan. Um, if you can't scan very close, there's no point in actually making the pickup loop uh, smaller. So right now we're limited. So as told you the squids that we use here were made by Hypris, and ultimately we are limited there because they use optical lithography. Uh, so, so even this uh, loop wasn't made by uh, Hypris? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, yes. They can do e-beam lithography um, if you pay them more. <laughs> so we might actually uh, uh, try that. Then the limit becomes uh, uh, that uh, because it's a multi-layer uh, kind of device, it actually has a topography. Uh, if, if I would take an AFM image, there's actually a terrace structure. And at some point, I can't get quite close enough anymore with a pickup loop. And then the solution is really to just strip down the, the squid. Like at, at that point, if you want to, so I should say the smaller squids uh, that we have are three nanometers in, in diameter. If you use those, uh, we get maybe a spatial resolution of half a micron or so. If we want to go uh, below that, I think that we have to use much simpler squids. And so you might be so there's um, yeah uh, there's the squid on the tip, um, which is really nice, gives you maybe a spatial resolution of 100 nanometers. I think they can make it even a lot smaller. Um, we are actually just now starting to also make nano squids, not on a tip, but just in a planar geometry. But then it's just a, a single step lithography weak link uh, squid, like a single, literally the whole loop then is, is your probe. You lose, you lose uh, the linearization, you can't have the modulation coils anymore. If you do build in a field coil, you will have to deal with the fact that the field coil also directly couples uh, into your squid and such. But, but if you have a simple geometry like this, uh, you can make it small and you can also get close and you need both. Any other questions? Yeah, let's catch again. Yeah. Okay, students.